Well, you can open up your Bible to the book of James chapter 5. James chapter 5. If you're using one of the Bibles that we handed out uh, at the beginning of communion, it's going to be on the right side of your Bible, page 179. We'll be working our way through James chapter 5 this week and next as we're wrapping up the book of James. And as we've made our way through the book of James, we've seen some incredibly practical and convicting instruction for the believer in Jesus Christ. The believer in Jesus Christ has had their eternal destiny changed, no longer under the wrath of God, but now reconciled to God, looking forward to eternity with him. And all of this is because of Jesus. We know this to be true. But that's not all that changes for the believer. The eternal destiny of one is not all that changes for the believer. Their life changes. For whom they live changes in this life. They, by the work of Christ, are able to live for the glory of Christ and are able to overcome the power of sin and live holy lives that reflect that of their Savior. This is where James started in chapter 1, that, listen, being a believer in Jesus doesn't free you from the world's troubles, but it does free you from sin's power. And so God uses the trials and the struggles of this world to bring you into maturity as you are conformed into Christ's image. And for the believer, they are to count the trials of this world joy because of the faithfulness of God to them in the midst of their trials. Well, in chapter 5, we're going to see James again pick up this idea of enduring hardships and enduring trials and persevering in them and trusting God in the midst of them being patient, waiting for his return. We see James give a call that in your trials, don't compromise your holiness, but pursue holiness, trusting in God, trusting in God's character, longing for Christ's return. Let's read together James chapter five, starting in verse one, we're gonna read through chapter 12 and work through that together this morning. James chapter five, verse one. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields And which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured, who have heard of the endurance of Job and have, you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Will you pray with me? God, in this passage, our sobering, stop you in your tracks, realities, and also sweet, precious truths for those who are yours. And I pray that this morning you would help us to see what we must about you, that you would help us to see what we must about your desire for us. And Lord, that we would 
learn how to endure hardships with much patience in a way that is pleasing to you. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, precious section of scripture that really calls the believer to endure hardship with patience. To endure hardship with patience. The real thrust of this passage is found in the command in verse 7, where James says, be patient. Be patient. And the reality of verse 11, that we count those blessed who endured. That is the emphasis of this text. That is what we must see in this passage, that there is a call for the believer to endure hardship with patience. This world is full of trials and hardships and struggles and persecutions. And for the believer especially, we've even experienced many various hardships as a church in the last few years. Yet the call for the believer is to endure these hardships with patience. And where the world, those who don't know Jesus, have no hope, the believer has a unique hope in God that allows them to endure. That allows them to press on in the hardships of this life and to do so uniquely. To press on in the struggles and persecutions of this world and the believer is to do so with patience. And James gives two aids that help the believer endure hardship with patience. Two things you must know that will aid you or help you endure hardships with patience. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. First, we see the call to endure hardship with patience. We must know a couple things. The first thing is the indictment against the oppressors. And we're going to break these down. We have two main points with several points underneath each one. And so first, endure hardship with patience, knowing the indictment against the oppressors. This is really a five-part indictment that we see in verses one through six. The first part of this section really gives a denunciation against those who oppress others for their own personal gain. And then the second half of the passage we'll look at in a bit is James giving specific instruction on how to react, how to respond to such experiences of oppression and hardship. In verse 1, James condemns the ungodly rich. He condemns the ungodly rich, but gives his attention primarily uh, later to instructing believers on how to respond to such oppression. James speaks to those in the first few verses, to those who are rich, but really speaking to their misery and then goes beyond them to those suffering to give instruction on how to endure hardships that they're facing under that oppression to do so with patience and in a God-honoring way. And it's important to note he's not condemning riches, but rather those who are evil and consumed with their riches. This is the one who is living constantly without God in view, like we saw in chapter four, the person not concerned with God's presence. This person has no regard for God and in fact is gaining wealth at the expense of others, including believers. And in verse one, James references the rich, but as the passage unfolds, we see this as more specifically rich people who have acquired their wealth evilly with evil intentions at the expense of others. These are rich people who are oppressing others. And as James continues in this chapter, they are particularly oppressing Christians. So what is the indictment against these rich oppressors? Well, first we see their misery is imminent. The first indictment we see here is their misery is imminent. Look again at verse one. Look at what James says. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Their misery is imminent. Whatever good the evil man believes he has or is experiencing, the reality is that that is going to come to an end quickly. And James here gives instruction for the rich man who is clearly an evil man and the instruction is to weep and to howl. The reason is because for the rich man who is evil and has acquired his wealth immorally, there is an imminent judgment or miseries coming for him. There is an inescapable doom that is coming against them. And the only appropriate response in light of this doom is to weep and to howl. To weep, that is to to sob out loud or to lament. This is the kind of weeping that would take place when wailing for the dead. Or it could also be used for weeping out of utter shame. This is an intense outburst of grief. And the grief here isn't one of remorse. 
but of recognition of the just punishment which is coming, which will bring misery. And to howl, it just intensifies the despair of those facing this imminent misery. And overwhelming trouble will come upon the wicked rich person when they stand before God in judgment. Judgment is coming for every ungodly person. Everyone who dies without Christ will face judgment. A horrendous judgment and a righteous fury of wrath. Yet for those rich in this world, there is a false comfort. While they experience pleasures in this world, they are fleeting. And oftentimes, it's the rich who think they have everything. They scoff at the thought of judgment. They have things together. Things are going well. That might even be you this morning. Judgment? But the reality is that if you have lived an ungodly life at the expense of others, not showing love, but rather taking advantage of them for your own personal wealth, the appropriate response to what is coming to that one is a response of weeping and howling because misery is imminent. You may have temporarily escaped hardship in this life at the expense of others, but you will in the day of judgment be brought into eternal misery. Have you ever seen a rich person, an immoral rich person, a scammer, a cheat, who had everything they ever wanted and thought, man, I, I wish I had things like that. I wish I had those things. Don't. Don't think that way. For, for the rich oppressors, their misery is imminent. What's the next indictment we see? Next, number two, we see their riches are worthless. Their riches are worthless. We see that in verses two and three. Look at verse two in the first part of verse three. James says, your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, and your gold and silver have rusted. James gives three categories of these evil rich man's wealth that have proven themselves worthless. Their riches have rotted. This is most likely referring to grain or some kind of crop they stored up that is now rotted. And he says their, their garments have become moth-eaten. And another form of wealth was extravagant clothing. Long robes with rich embroidery on them and decorations were a sign of wealth. And these garments would be stored and what would happen is that when there were high temperatures, which was frequent, a larva would come from moths and it would damage the clothing and ruin them. And then he also says, your gold and silver have rusted. While gold and silver uh, don't rust, the coins at that time were mixed with large amounts of alloy and, and they actually did rust. And so this is most likely what James is referring to. Thus, their, their hoarded wealth would be as worthless as rusted out iron. And he says, in the day of judgment, what they have spent their life and their morals acquiring will actually testify against them. Look at the second half of verse three. He says, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. These people think they are securing their future with their ill-gotten gain. In reality, they are securing their doom. In the ruin of their wealth, their own demise is illustrated. And the only true worth of their treasures is the valid testimony that they are against them. Their life's pursuit gained them nothing and cost them everything. Their wealth bears witness against them and their guilt is certain. Like rust consumes metal, the witness of these vain pursuits will bring judgment that consumes their flesh like fire. This is hell. This is the impending judgment on the unbeliever. It is real and it is horrible. It is righteous. It is just. And for those who concern themselves with such vain things in the last days, in the days where Christ could return at any moment, it is an utter shame for that one and in light of this, we just have to consider, we have to consider, we have to give thought to, well, what are our pursuits? What are our treasures? What do we concern ourselves with? 
And what would they testify about you should Christ return this very day? If Christ returned today, would you be an ashamed workman or an unashamed workman? Would you have spent your life storing up earthly treasures at the expense of pursuing what is pleasing to the Lord? Not all rich people get rich immorally. And it's not that James is condemning wealth, but it's those who have preoccupied themselves with the gain of wealth at the expense of honoring God, at the expense of pursuing God, and really at the expense of others. This one isn't filled with love and consideration for others, but self-love. Looking at the evil rich person and what awaits them must cause each one of us to just simply consider ourselves. The indictment against the oppressors, first we see their misery is imminent, and then we see their riches are worthless, and next in verse four we see their guilt is certain. Their guilt is certain. The wicked rich man acquires his wealth sinfully. This one is not generous to the poor, but capitalizes on the poor. The wicked rich doesn't pay their workers what they are due. Look at the first half of verse four. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. Their guilt is certain. James starts this verse with the word behold. This shows his intense emphasis on the guilt of these evil rich men. The charges demand serious attention. The oppression against these poor laborers is atrocious. They are living in luxury and not paying what they owe. These laborers were an essential part of Israel's economy and withholding their wages was actually specifically prohibited by the Old Testament. In Jeremiah twenty-two thirteen, 13, we see it is so serious that Jeremiah pronounces a curse on those who did this. You don't need to turn there, but you can just listen. Jeremiah says this in verse 13 of chapter 22. He says, woe to him who builds his house without righteousness and his upper rooms without justice, who uses his neighbor's services without pay and does not give him his wages. The rest of their riches in verse three were a witness against the evil rich man. And here we also see that the withholding of proper pay cries out against them as well. Their guilt is certain. There's no defense, but the facts demonstrate their guilt. The riches that quickly pass away are a witness against them. And the fact they have acquired these things immorally at the expense of others cries out against them also. And James furthers this point by stating that the outcry of those harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The cries of those being wronged, God has heard. This should strike terror in the heart of the offender. Sabaoth means hosts or armies. So the Lord of Sabaoth describes God as the commander of the armies of heaven. And it is this one who hears the cries of the defrauded poor. While the evil employers did not take notice of the cries of those they have wronged, God has taken notice. And his judgment is being prepared. He knows every specific detail of the defrauding evil that is taking place. And he is Lord over the armies of heaven. And whatever punishment is due, it will be swift and executed with no obstructions. These evil rich oppressors, guilt is certain. Next, number four. The next indictment against the evil oppressors is their self-indulgence is temporary. Their self-indulgence is temporary. The rich man has gained his wealth unjustly and has saved it all up even though it won't last. And the wicked rich man has also used his money for selfish, selfish pleasures and yet these are temporary. Look at verse five. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. 
This rich man has lived a life of luxury, easy living at the expense of others. To live a life of luxury on the earth demonstrates a preoccupation with earthly things and earthly pleasures and earthly goods. This life of wanton pleasure means that the man is strictly concerned with gratifying his desires for the things of this world. There's no regard for the needs of others, only self. There is an extravagant, unrestrained self-indulgence. Yet it is temporary. This self-indulgence has demonstrated itself to be preparatory for the day of judgment. It's preparatory for the day of slaughter. Their self-indulgence is temporary and has only served to heap more judgment for them as their hearts have been fattened. Their inner being has been being fed by their own self-indulgence, thus preparing them amply for the judgment that awaits them. This luxurious life of pleasure is quickly going to come to an end like a cow that gorges itself, ignorantly preparing itself for the slaughter they have in their defiance and in their ignorance and foolishness feasted on the pleasures of this world and have only prepared themselves to receive the just punishment that awaits them. This is a terrifying picture of judgment. The selfish indulgence of the evil rich man is pictured as a fattened calf headed for the slaughterhouse of divine judgment. And apart from saving faith in Christ, that is what awaits them. And then we see the last indictment in verse 6. We see their injustice is murderous. Their injustice is murderous. They will do whatever it takes to defend themselves and their riches, even murder. Look at verse six. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. The evil rich man would literally kill to keep, to maintain their riches and their lifestyle. The evil rich men were using the courts in a corrupt way. To, to judicially condemn someone in false sentences that led to horrific outcomes, even death, which in essence was murder. The victims of the rich oppressors were innocent of any crime or wrongdoing, yet they were being condemned in the court and put to death. And it seems that the victims were defrauded believers who were entrusting themselves to God's care in this injustice, just as Jesus did when he was put to death. James says the righteous man is being put to death. He does not resist you. The picture of the righteous one being oppressed in these verses is one of humble submission, even under unrighteous rule. This is similar to Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5, 39, where he says, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. This also seems similar to Jesus' example we see from 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, where Peter says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously." James himself, according to the account of Eusebius, practiced this at his own martyrdom. This is not a natural reaction to unrighteousness. To be unresisting when one is committed to death as an innocent victim is evidence of one controlled by the Holy Spirit. This one is meek. This one is full of compassion, knowing the judgment that awaits their persecutor. And this one is courageous and steadfast, knowing the riches that await them in eternity. Are you in a spot where you're able to trust God when unjustly dealt with for someone else's gain? We need to be. These verses clearly condemn the evil rich man. Anyone reading this letter or hearing it would and should do some self-evaluation in light of this stern warning of what awaits the evil rich. But this section also serves the one being oppressed. 
God's verdict is certain. God sees and knows and will deal with these evil ones. And James's instruction isn't for the believer to change the oppressors who are oppressing them. God sees all and God will deal with them in the right time far more justly than we ever could. Rather, James in this passage doesn't even call these evil rich people to repent, which seems to indicate his emphasis for for this passage is for those who are enduring hardship to do so with patience and understanding of what awaits the evil, unrepentant, rich one oppressing them. You see, those under evil, rich oppressors don't need to deal with the oppressors because we see in this passage clearly God will deal with them. God is righteous. God is judge. Nothing escapes him. And so the believer is to trust God with what awaits them. But yet there is specific instruction for us in how to do this. You see, what we find next is you don't endure hardship by changing your circumstances or changing the people around you regardless of how evil they are. You endure hardship patiently by trusting God and embracing what he calls you to be in your hardship. And that's what we see next. Next, we see the instruction for the the oppressed. First, we saw the indictment against the oppressors. And now we see the specific instruction for the oppressed. And this instruction could be categorized into four commands. We see this first in verses 7 and 8, the instruction to be patient, anticipating the Lord's return. The instruction for the oppressed begins with the instruction to be patient, anticipating the Lord's return. Look at the first part of verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. Therefore, be patient. You too, be patient. One of your greatest aids to living faithfully in a sin-filled, trial-filled world is remembering that this world is not all that there is. This world is not your home if you are a believer. And one of your greatest aids is keeping an eternal perspective and to wait patiently and longingly for Jesus' return. He's coming. Is your life full of trials? Are you experiencing hardship? Maybe even now, maybe it's persecution by the ungodly. Maybe it's physical pain and ailments or sickness. Maybe it's difficult relationships. Listen, things won't always be as they are. So be patient. Be patient in those trials, in those hardships, anticipating the Lord's return. Look again at verses seven and eight. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Every believer should live in the hope of and the certainty of Christ's return. James gives an illustration to help his readers. The farmer plants, toils, works, and must wait patiently. That farmer has to depend on something outside of his control, and those crops are the most precious thing to the farmer because he depends on them for his existence, for his livelihood. The reference to early and late rains demonstrates that the farmer had to wait an extended period of time and had to do so patiently. And like the farmer, the Christian must be patient and wait for the Lord. He's coming. And yet James says, strengthen your heart. There is a fortifying of the heart that must take place as you wait. This is heart shepherding. Hardships are real. They are difficult. Yet what will you think about your trial you are in right now when you've been enjoying the presence of God, worshiping him for 10,000 years? In your hardship, be patient, anticipating the Lord's return. Next, we see the instruction, do not complain against one another. Do not complain against one another. We see this in verse nine. Not only do you need to wait patiently for the Lord, anticipating his return, you also need to control yourself that you don't become a complainer. Look again at verse nine. 
It's right there. Do not complain, brethren, against one another. And this complaining, this is, is to sigh or groan because of your circumstances. And listen, to complain outwardly reveals what is going on in your heart in that moment. If you're complaining in your heart, you are not trusting God. This person complaining here against others is one who is finding criticism and fault, finding, uh, finding these things and, and directing it against others. There's a smoldering resentment that is expressing itself in complaining. Maybe people aren't supporting you in your trial in the way that you want, and so you complain against them. Maybe you're going through something extremely difficult, and those around you uh, haven't done anything wrong, but they're easy and comfortable targets. Maybe you're going through a trial and those next to you are going through something and you think, well, they're not going through something as bad as me. And so you complain against them. Well, the instruction is clear. Do not complain. Don't grumble against one another. It's not enough to simply act restrained against your oppressors. You must be content among your brothers. And listen, it's difficult to keep a right perspective when things are hard. James knows this. That's why he uses the term brethren. It's endearing. It's full of compassion. We live in a world with a lot of hard things that happen. People die. They get sick. Experience pain. Disappointment. You get hurt. You get sinned against. You will sin against others. And what would be tragic is if we know what we know about God, if we experience what we've experienced in grace, and yet we still complain when things don't go our way. And yet it seems there's a particular susceptibility to complaining even amongst ourselves when we're facing hardships from outside. And you probably know that to be true. Men, have you ever had a hard thing at work and you come home and your kids do something and it's extremely minor and you go off on them? It happens in the body of Christ as well and it shouldn't. In fact, our love for one another, our, our care for one another is a distinguishing factor of how the world knows that we are Christ. And so how much more in the face of hardship and trials must we maintain unity? Must we maintain love and encouragement and be gracious and kind with one another? And James says, don't do this so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Judgment unto damnation is coming for the unbeliever, but for the believer, you will still be judged by your actions, not unto condemnation, but you'll give an account. And God is near. And this reality should create a fear of God that leads to humble obedience that we would not grumble, complain against each other. Next, we see the instruction to see God's compassion and mercy through godly examples. We're instructed next, number three, to see God's compassion and mercy through godly examples. We see this in verses 10 and 11. Look at verse 10. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, and then here's the instruction, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The main verb is take. James says, take the prophets as an example of suffering and patience. Those who endure are blessed, and what we find in the outcome of God's dealings uh, with Job is that, look at the end of verse 11, the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. The point of the godly examples is that they point to God's character and trustworthiness. So we are to see God's compassion and mercy through, God's, or through godly examples. We are to look through the godly examples to see the merciful, compassionate God. As James encouraged the believers who desire to live faithfully in a trial-filled world, he points them to the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord and yet endured trials and hardships. Now, look again at verse 10. 
As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. These prophets were highly esteemed by the Jewish people, and they spoke in the name of Yahweh and yet endured hardships. And it's important to note that closeness to God does not secure ease of earthly circumstances. It does secure joy in God and eternity with him, which is far, far, far better. The patience under trial that was demonstrated by the prophets is a means of encouragement for believers to endure faithfully the trials that they will face. And those who patiently endure are those who receive divine favor. Look at the first part of verse 11. We count those blessed who endured. It seems so-called Christians get it backwards oftentimes. They believe divine blessing is the absence of trials, and God says divine blessings come for those who faithfully endure trials. And then James refers to one person specifically. He says in verse 11, you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. And we also see God is divinely sovereign, that we would look at this passage on the day that equipping hour starts, looking at Job. So I'm not going to get too much into the life of Job, but you should stay after for equipping hour and Scott will unpack Job in much more detail in a way that I'm sure will be incredibly encouraging and a blessing to you. What we do know is Job experienced tremendous calamity and suffering, and yet he endured in his trials. Even in all of his hardship, he was unwaveringly devoted to God. He was not perfect and he had his own weaknesses, but he did not waver from his loyalty to God. He did not forsake God when he felt forsaken, and though his circumstances were crushing, his faith was not crushed. He endured. And we get the benefit of seeing what God did in the outcome, how God restored what Job had lost abundantly. And this serves as an illustration of the unshakable reality that God is full of compassion and is merciful. What a comfort. What a help. God does not simply enjoy watching his people suffer. Have you ever felt that way? God, do you just like watching me squirm? Maybe your kids have asked you that. Dad, do you just like watching me suffer? Why can't I go do this? <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we're kind of like, yeah, a little bit. No, we don't. We don't at all. God doesn't simply enjoy watching his people suffer. He's not vicious. He is using it for a specific, imp- uh, specific purpose which encompasses his character as being compassionate, which is conforming you more into Christ's likeness. The most loving, the most loving thing that God could do for you is make you more like Jesus. And in his divine wisdom, he uses trials and hardships to accomplish this. This is the compassion and mercy of God. Those who endure are blessed and we must, as we look to godly examples, see the compassion and the mercy of God that we might press on and endure hardship with patience, joyfully, longingly waiting for Christ's return. And then lastly, the last instruction for the oppressed is Speak with integrity that you not fall under judgment. Speak with integrity that you not fall under judgment. Some have suggested that this verse 12 is a transition to a new idea. I don't believe that is the case. I believe this is actually crucial instruction for those suffering and being oppressed. Look, look with me at what James says in verse 12. It says, but above all my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but... Your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. The point here is when in trials and hardships, don't default to swearing oaths, but rather default to the truth. Swearing an oath was a common practice of that day to bring in something external, to bring accountability or integrity 
to your claim. And Jesus is saying, above all, when facing trials and hardships, the Christian does not need this external practice, but is to be full of integrity. They're to speak with integrity. We must speak with integrity. The Christian who is suffering is to be controlled and calculated with their speech so as to have integrity. What we find as we look at this verse, oaths and swearing is not the primary issue, but the lack of a truthful testimony of your claim. The negative is don't swear by an oath, but the positive part of the instruction is let your yes be yes and your no be no. The Christian doesn't need a mechanism to be considered trustworthy because they're truthful. The real issue is following through with what you say. So do not make a rash promise in the midst of hardship, in the midst of your suffering and pain. Don't speak carelessly, making vain promises that you're not going to fulfill calling on specific oaths or even calling on the name of the Lord to try to convince your oppressors that you'll follow through. Rather, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And listen, there's a real vulnerability here. Have you ever been in a hardship and made a vow to God? Lord, this is so difficult. If you just take this away, I'll never do this again. I'll always do this. Never ask for anything else. If you just give me a wife, kids, the job I want, remove this relationship, remove this difficulty, remove this hardship. If you would just do this, I'd... Someone's threatening you and maybe to escape the punishment, you say, I I swear I didn't know. I swear I'll, I'll, I'll never speak about Christ at work again. Oh, words are precious. We've seen that as we've worked through the book of James. They can be precious tools or condemning instruments for ourselves. With a single word, a spark can start a forest ablaze, and so it is with our tongue. And yet also with our mouths, we can speak and proclaim of the mercies and compassion and goodness and greatness of God. We can proclaim and testify to his greatness in the midst of hardships. And so listen, speak truthfully. Don't make foolish claims. Don't make foolish vows and commitments, but be self-controlled, be discerning. Don't make rash promises in the midst of your suffering. Let your actions prove the sincerity of your words, not a rash vow. Don't try to get out of your trial or to get out of hardships by using careless words, careless vows or promises. Rather, trust God and be truthful. Be self-controlled. Be full of integrity. For to speak falsely or to make rash false promises incurs as grumbling does judgment from God. Are you prepared to suffer for Jesus? Are you prepared to suffer as a Christian, to endure hardships? Some, I imagine, are eager to suffer martyrdom for Christ's sake. If people persecute me, it needs to be for a righteous cause. I'm going to fight for injustice. I'm going to proclaim the gospel and I'll suffer for that. What about suffering as a Christian simply in the selfish gain of others? Are you ready to suffer for that? Are you, are you ready to be restrained and to not resist Maybe not when you're suffering for an explicit righteous cause promoting the name of Christ, but simply because you're being holy. Maybe you're just an easy target. Are you ready to trust God in those circumstances? Are you ready to be content? Are you ready to not resist the unrighteous oppressor, but to imitate Christ? Christ suffered for an unrighteous cause. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. 
While being scorned, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. Are you ready to entrust yourself to the one who judges righteously when in your mind it doesn't seem like the right reason to suffer? Godly suffering is never wasted when the sufferer is holy. It just isn't. We must trust God. We must depend on his character. We must be sobered by his judgment. And we must eagerly anticipate his return. We must endure hardship with patience. Knowing that God is sovereign. Knowing that God is good. Knowing that God is full of compassion. Loved his own glory to the point of sending his son so that we might be reconciled to him, so that we might have eternity with him. And if we can trust God with our eternal destiny in the hands of his son because of his son's sacrifice, how much more can we trust God in the midst of unjust persecution and oppression and various trials and hardships that we will face in this life? If, if you don't know Jesus, the message of the, the precious gospel that we love and that we proclaim and that we rejoice in here is not a gospel that makes life easy for you now. Life is hard. Sin is real. Sorrow is felt. But there is a hope in Christ There is a joy when everything in this world is lost. There is a joy that cannot be taken away. Rust can't destroy it. Moth can't eat it. It can't decay. That is found in Jesus. And so I would plead with you, repent and turn to him and trust your life to him. God's judgment is real. And yet his mercy is available for all who would repent and believe upon him. For us, Grace Bible Church, it has been just a precious privilege to watch you endure hardship with patience. To watch you rally around one another in the midst of trials, not grumble and complain against one another. God's work is evident in your life. God's compassion and mercy abounds within you. And yet we do not know what the rest of this day holds and what tomorrow holds. And yet we have a pretty good idea that more hardship is coming, more trials will be faced, more sorrow will be felt. And yet God's mercies are new every morning. He is an anchor for our soul. He is a hope that can never be taken away. He is a joy that never diminishes. And in the midst of our sorrow, he tends to us in our weakness. He calls us to comfort one another. And he promises us peace that is beyond comprehension as we present our requests to him with thankfulness in our hearts. We have so much to be thankful for. And whatever trial we find ourselves in, there is so much to be thankful for because of Jesus. He is so good. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for your steadfast love that will never change. It has been faithful throughout all generations and we can look back and see witnesses who only testify to your compassion and your mercy. And Lord, we know that whatever hardship awaits us, whatever hardship we're in now, your steadfast love and your compassion and your mercy still remains. And so we can trust you in the midst of difficult things. We can know that you will hold us fast in those things, that you will keep us, that you will give us strength to carry on and not simply to uh, endure in a get-by sense of the word, but to endure well, to to finish well, to continue in holiness and to please our Savior in the midst of the various struggles of this world. And so, Father, we plead for your help that we know you will give to your children and we entrust ourselves to you knowing that you are good and righteous. And Lord, we 
want to take up the causes that you want. We want to address the things that we can, which is our own response and reactions and holiness. And then with other evil oppressors, Lord, we pray that we would entrust them to you, that we would be humble and meek. Lord, that we would be godly in the midst of oppression, that we would be faithful in the midst of sorrow, that we would be trusting and that we would endure hardship with patience. Thank you for securing eternity. Thank you for the hope that we have. We pray in Christ's name, amen.